on this order. Much of the uh, ideas and suggestions that they had have been incorporated. It is so much better when we work together than when we work alone. And I think we've shown throughout this pandemic, at least here in North Texas and particularly in Dallas County with our business community, our schools and our faith community, that we can not only work um, together, but we can do that quickly. I wanna thank everyone who has uh, been on the phone with me until one o'clock uh, this morning and uh, beginning again at seven o'clock this morning on Zooms and calls and uh, other uh, Teams meetings, uh, giving me your thoughts and helping us in crafting this order. Uh, I've also asked to uh, come and uh, be a part of the signing. I'm gonna sign this here in a moment and read it to you. Uh, the parents who, who brought a lawsuit uh, to protect their children, their children that have medical conditions and need to be safe at school, but also need the experience of in-person learning that we want so much for all of our kids. So proud of, of them. And, and after I speak, I'm gonna uh, ask uh, that one of those moms uh, say a few words as well. So uh, let me now sign this and I will read it to you. Uh, let me read you. The order has been signed, and I'm going to read it to you now in pertinent part. I'm going to answer some FAQs that I think you might ask. Then I'm going to turn it over um, to uh, Jenna Royale and Melissa Griffith. Jenna is a lawyer. Melissa uh, is one of those brave moms to say a few words, and then I'll take some questions. Um, so I'm gonna read it to you in pertinent part. There are some whereases before uh, uh, the, uh, the, the pertinent part, but uh, the pertinent part reads as follows. Uh, Under the authority of the Texas Government Code, section 418.108, Dallas County Judge Clay Jenkins orders, number one, effective as of 11.59 p.m. on August 11, 2021, and continuing until rescinded by the Dallas County Judge Clay Jenkins. Roman numeral one, health and safety policy, pre-K through K through 12 public schools and child care centers. From the date of this executive order, all child care centers and pre-K through 12 public schools operating in Dallas County must develop and implement a health and safety policy. The health and safety policy must require, at a minimum, universal indoor masking for all teachers, staff, students, and visitors to child care centers and pre-K through 12 schools, regardless of vaccination status, except for children under the age of two years. The health and safety policy required to be developed and implemented by this executive order may also include the implementation of other mitigating measures recommended by the CDC to control and reduce the transmission of COVID-19, such as maintaining at least three feet of physical distance between students within classrooms. Roman numeral number two, health and safety policy commercial entities. From the date of this executive order, all commercial entities in Dallas County providing goods or services directly to the public must develop and implement a health and safety policy. The health and safety policy must require, at a minimum, universal indoor masking for all employees and visitors to the commercial entity's business premises or other facility. The health and safety policy required to be developed and implemented by this executive order may also include the implementation of other mitigating measures designed to control and reduce the transmission of COVID-19, such as temperature checks or health screening. Commercial entities must post the health and safety policy required by this executive order in a conspicuous location sufficient to provide notice to employees and visitors of all health and safety requirements. Failure to develop and implement the health and safety policy required by this order 
within three calendar days following the effective date may result in a fine not to exceed $1,000 for each violation. Any peace officer or other person of lawful authority is hereby authorized to enforce the provisions of this order in accordance with the authority granted under the Texas Disaster Act of 1975. Roman numeral three, face coverings required in all Dallas County buildings. From the date of this executive order, all employees, contractors, and visitors when on the premise of a building or offices owned or operated by Dallas County are required to wear a face mask regardless of vaccination status. Roman numeral number four, face covering strongly urged within the general public. It is strongly urged that all people two years or older wear a face mask in a public indoor setting. No civil or criminal penalty will be imposed on individuals for failure to wear a face mask. Please note that a face coverings are secondary to other mitigation efforts. The most important thing, obviously, is that everyone get vaccinated as soon as possible. But face coverings are not a replacement for social distancing, frequent hand washing, or self-isolation when sick. People should follow CDC recommendations for how to wear and take off a face mask. Residents should keep up the following habits while in public. Washing hands before you leave home or when you return staying at least six feet away from others, avoiding touching your nose and face, not using disposable mask more than three times and washing reusable cloth mask regularly to prevent the spread of the virus. It is ordered, and I've signed my name there too. Um, before I turn it over uh, to our other speaker, which she'll speak briefly, and then we'll have an opportunity for you to ask me questions to so that several of you don't ask me the same question i've got some frequently asked questions that i'm facts i guess you know fact sheet i guess um so i want to kind of go over that and i'll ask those somewhat you know rhetorically when does this order take effect the order takes effect today at 11 59 p.m what entities do does the mandatory face mask requirement apply to? The order applies to child care centers, pre-K through 12 public schools, businesses, and Dallas County buildings and facilities. What are schools required to do under the order? All child care facilities and pre-K through 12 public schools must develop a health and safety plan. And this policy must mandate that teachers, staff, students, and visitors wear a mask while on the school's premises. Schools may also include other mitigation measures in their health and safety policy at their own discretion. What are businesses required to do under the order? Businesses are required uh, that are operating in Dallas County, that is, are required to develop a health and safety policy. And this policy must mandate that all employees or visitors wear a mask while on the property um, and um, businesses may also include other mitigating measures in their health and safety policy at their own discretion. And businesses must post their health and safety plan in a location where employees and visitors can easily see it uh, when they're entering the uh, building or before they enter the building, um, not or, but before they enter the building. Um, so what steps must uh, a business take to implement the health and safety policy. Well, businesses need to take reasonable steps uh, to require that face masks are worn on their premises, such as posting signage uh, stating that masks are required before people get into the building. Having employees monitor the premises to ensure that people are in fact wearing a mask and verbally uh, instructing visitors not wearing a mask that it's a requirement on the premises. Um, what is the penalty if a business does not develop or enforce their health and safety policy? Uh, in Dallas County, we work closely with our businesses. We've yet to have a single instance of someone uh, needing to be fined um, uh, in our businesses. Well, I take that back. I forgot about a hairdresser. But uh, of, other, of most businesses, we've yet to have a single person or business uh, not uh, be able to, to follow this. This is, by the way, the same uh, policy that Governor Abbott 
uh, lauded when it was first done in, in uh, Bear County six months ago. Um, that's the framework that we used six months ago or uh, several months ago, what we're using today. Theoretically, if a business um, it refuses to uh, comply, they could be fined. However, businesses won't be fined if they're taking all reasonable steps to enforce uh, their face mask requirements. How does the order apply to residential property? Well, common areas of residential property like apartment uh, uh, buildings or, or uh, high rises, such as laundry rooms, mail rooms, gyms, lobbies, elevators, are subject to the face mask requirement included in the order, but individuals are not required to wear a face mask inside their own home or in another individual's home. How does the order apply to Dallas County buildings? We're requiring face masks for people who are two years old or older. Um, well, can individual be penalized for not wearing a face mask in a public space? No, no civil or criminal penalty will be imposed on individuals for failure to wear a mask under this order. Um, I'll answer more questions in a moment if there are any, but right now, I want to turn uh, uh, the screen over to Jenna Royal, who represents uh, 12 parents who uh, brought a suit. And she's going to introduce Melissa Griffith, uh, who's going to talk to us today about her story. And I want to say to those parents, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, I'm so glad that uh, through the work of these uh, great lawyers, we were able to help you. And I'm glad that you were standing up for countless other parents who share your concern. Uh, they, they want to send their kids to school and they want their child to be masked, but they don't want their child to be made fun of or bullied. They want to send their child to school because of their uh, underlying um, you know, conditions. They need that in-person learning, but they don't want to risk um, their child's health uh, unnecessarily to do that because you've stood up, those who have not filed a lawsuit, not taken money out of their pocket are benefiting uh, because of your work. And so I wanna thank you on behalf of the 2.7 million people who live here um, in Dallas County for doing that. And I'm gonna turn it over now to, to uh, Attorney General Royal. Thank you so much, Cle uh, Judge Jenkins. I, uh, I just want to say thank you on behalf of all of the parents and the students that you are protecting here today with this order. Um, so many parents, myself included, have been fighting for months to ensure that our kids can return to school safely, but it really wasn't until I heard the stories of parents like Melissa and her daughter that I really truly understood the impact of kids being forced to return to school without everyone wearing a mask. I know that everybody wants to hear from Melissa, so I'm not going to speak too long, but I did want to say thank you on behalf of all of us. Melissa, why don't you go ahead and tell them your story? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Uh, my name is Melissa Griffith. Um, and as Jenna said, um, I am one of the 12 parents who um, was actually how I feel uh, it was, was given the opportunity to join in on this lawsuit and advocate not only for my daughter, but I know for um, just, you know, millions of parents really who um, were feeling a lot of panic and um, a lot of uncertainty and fear um, about this upcoming school year. And um, uh, Judge Jenkins, I just also wanted to thank you personally um, for really stepping up and doing what really no one else has been able to do, which is um, take steps to, to really help our kids. Um, so, so yeah, so my daughter um, happens to be one of the medically fragile children um, that's involved in this lawsuit who is, you know, really thrives in class, but who has some medical issues who could really be put at risk if she gets COVID. And, um, but who for virtual learning, it, it's, not, it's not right for her. Um, she has an IEP that requires um, a one-to-one -one aid. 
she is profoundly physically disabled, but is cognitively typical. So she's in all gen ed classes. Um, she's going into first grade, but reads at a second grade level and um, is really missing her friends, was asking if all of her friends had forgotten about her already or, you know, was were her new friends in class going to be as fun as her friends were last year. Um, this is a child who um, needs that social interaction, who is really missing that friend to friend interaction, definitely that student teacher interaction. But furthermore, if we were to try to do virtual again, I would literally have to be at her side at all times. She cannot even activate the mute and unmute button on an iPad. So a virtual um, classroom is just not something that would be possible for us. And um, I think that um, she really deserves to have a safe environment to go to school in. Um, and as we saw from last year, masks work. Um, so I think that was just kind of the biggest reason for me to really advocate to have masks reintroduced this school year. We had a really successful year uh, last year. Um, both she and her sister remained safe. And um, so, yeah, so I think that that was just the biggest kind of catalyst for me to really stand up for this. And I, I know several other parents who are kind of in the same boat where um, as much as we would like to just kind of maybe step back and, and do the virtual schooling, that just really isn't a, a workable thing for us and um, let alone all the other parents who, who really can't make that work for whether it's their um, working schedule or um, things like that. So, um, so yeah, so that's kind of our story and uh, I'm really excited to be able to send her um, and really look forward to the start of the school year rather than kind of have that um, that 50, 50 poll and have more of it be fear. So I really appreciate it from a, from a parental standpoint. Thank you so much, uh, Melissa. And, uh, thanks for being a great mom. And we're so glad that, uh, this will help your child and other children like her, uh, and all of our children. Um, so we're going to open up for questions and you can ask a question of me or the lawyers, uh, or Melissa. Um, uh, I saw, so there's two ways to ask questions. I suppose you can raise your hand and I already see two hands up. And I'll start with Stephen Dial. And for some reason, people don't want to do that. You can put something in this chat box uh, too. And I'll make sure my staff helps me so I don't miss anyone. Stephen, go ahead and ask your question. Judge, uh, two quick questions. One, did you consult uh, with your fellow commissioners before uh, coming up with this order? I know months ago, they kind of limited your role and your executive authority. And then also, um, how long do you think this will last seeing as, you know, is this, you, are you making this order based off of the judge's TRO or just because you say you found a loophole in the governor's existing order? So a lot of questions uh, there. Let me try to kind of break them down. So um, I've got to be very cognizant of the Open Meetings Act and talking uh, to my colleagues in making a decision. And chapter 418 of the government code vests the power to make these emergency orders solely with the county judge. Given the current situation we're in, where one of the commissioners is uh, literally uh, suing me, et cetera, uh, to remove me from office, um, I'm uh, doing, the, uh, uh, doing uh, this under my authority as the emergency management director. I think that was one question. Another question was, under what authority are you doing this uh, under Judge Parker's order or are you doing it under some other authority? Well, so I'm doing it under the authority given to me under chapter 418 of the government code. What Judge Parker has done is she has agreed with the arguments um, of me and, uh, and my lawyers and disagreed with the arguments of Governor Abbott and his lawyers. So very briefly, and the lawyers could probably do much more justice to this than I will here, Stephen, but we made uh, arguments that uh, boil down in a nutshell are the statute gives the governor certain authority 
for instance, the authority to suspend or rescind a regulatory statute in furtherance of a response. A regulatory statute like a Louisiana nurse doesn't have to sit for boards here to help in an emergency. That's, a, that's one of those regulatory statutes that he rescinded uh, early on in COVID. But stopping mayors and county judges from responding to the emergency uh, in total is not a regulatory statute, nor is it something that the legislature gave him the authority to do. The emergency power uh, was delegated to the legislature over 100 years ago. The legislature set up a framework in 1975 as to who would exercise that. They even came up with a scenario where what happens in a local emergency if the mayor and the county judge disagree. And in that statute, they said, well, the county judge, since the county's bigger, his, his rulings would control. Absent from that was any discussion of what happens if the governor and the county judge or the mayor disagree about a local matter, because it was never contemplated that the, the governor would take over and try to macromanage uh, a local emergency. Um, the governor's uh, argument was, well, um, the judges and the mayors are merely my, my agent and under the traditional um, uh, doctrine of agency, um, they can only do what I tell them to do. Um, under a traditional agency doctrine, so if, if, um, if I have an agent, I could theoretically replace my agent, I could fire my agent, I could suspend my agent. Uh, clearly that is not the tradition in the traditional sense what we have here when county judges and mayors have the agency of the state authority to react uh, and protect in an emergency. So the judge rejected that argument as well. So both under the authority that existed before the judge ruled and under the uh, authority that is clarified and strengthened by the temporary restraining order, uh, I'm acting. And I, and I may have missed one of your other questions. I hope not, but that's my best at answering them. Uh, next uh, hand up is Steve Pickett. Steve, what do you got? Judge, I just wanted you to, uh, you touched on this yesterday. Can you explain to the public uh, the initial concern to take this action? What is happening in this county right now regarding the public health that move you in this direction? Yeah, great question, because we don't want to lose sight of the fact that this is not, um, you know, parents versus Governor Abbott or Clay Jenkins versus Governor Abbott or, or the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated. Uh, this is all of us. We are all team public health and the enemy is the virus. And right now the enemy is winning. The enemy has, uh, has re-transformed itself into the Delta variant where Steve, when this began, when it first began, we had a, a replication factor called an r naught factor of two. That means for every person that got sick, they could give it to two people. That quickly, with some distancing and hand washing, even before we understood about masks, frankly, um, uh, that quickly got down into the low ones. But even in the low ones, when you've got thousands of people getting sick and for every, you know, um, 10,000, they're giving it to 12 or 14 or 16,000. Um, it gets out of hand really, really quickly. But with the Delta, uh, but when, and when we're seeing those huge surges, we were in the ones, 1.4, 1.5, 1.6. The, the Delta variant is spreading at an RMAT factor of 5.0. So for every person that gets sick, five, or five more people are getting sick. That's unprecedented. So you've got this unprecedented spread. It, the number, if you look at the sheer number of people in the hospital, the sheer number of people um, who are getting sick every day is not at the all time high. But also what has happened, Steve, is our hospital staffing situation has deteriorated rapidly and, and um, from where we were um, nine months ago. The governor pulled the order for temporary staffing 
while other states continued to lure people to do temporary staffing work. Um, if you recall for two weeks, the governor said, I'm not gonna pay for that. You're gonna have to get cities to pay for temporary staffing for their hospitals. The effect of all that was uh, the, the, the scarce temporary staff that's out there has contracts with other states. And not only that, but the headhunters for those staffing companies were able to go to local hospitals and say, how would you like to make two or three times what you're making now to, to stay in a hotel room for a while and work somewhere else? So we've lost a lot of staff. And, and then finally, what's happened uh, is people are burned out and there are a lot of people that have taken early retirement. So when we look at our hospitals right now, Steve, what we see is a situation where although there's not as many people in the hospital as there were at the very, very height of this, we're getting pretty close, unfortunately, but we're not quite there yet. We have a lot less beds that are available because similar to tables in a restaurant, if you don't have staff uh, to take care of things, you can't open the table. So you have a lot less beds that are available because you have a lot less staff. And that's a problem that will now be uh, hopefully getting better now that the governor has reversed course on that and allowed the staffing con put those staffing contracts and that pay source back in place, but that'll take time. Now we're trying to buy our hospital some time by doing everything that we all can do um, uh, to, to get through this. And, and the two main things we can do is we can get vaccinated and then we can wear our mask when we're in public settings. That's what the CDC says will give us our best chance to save some lives right now. Thank you for the question, Steve. Lori uh, Brown is next. Hey there, um, so I have two questions. It sounds very likely that the governor is going to be appealing this. What do you expect the Texas Supreme Court to rule? And my second question is about daycares and I'm just wanting to confirm, it sounds like this is going to be new that daycares require the masks for kids because in the past, I don't think that daycares were requiring that for the for the two and up kids. Um, so the first question, you know, and I don't mean this to be, you know, uh, uh, flippant about that, but if I knew what the Supreme Court uh, would do and I could predict the future, I wouldn't be your county judge. I would be in Vegas uh, living large, right? And I'm not a gambler. So I, I just don't know. Um, you know, I think what uh, can happen, Lori, and the lawyers could probably speak to that better, um, but, you know, they'll have a variety of appellate maneuvers that they'll take, and, and uh, we'll just have to see what happens and what the appellate courts uh, do with those. Um, the question of child uh, care centers, so I haven't been able to talk to everyone, but um, I have been able to talk to all of our public school superintendents or their designees who got on the 8.30 call this morning. And they talked about the, um, uh, the importance of protecting kids, you know, all the way down. So my initial, just, you know, give you kind of a look behind the curtain. Initially I said K through 12 and, and they, so someone said, what about pre-K? And so we talked to the doctors about pre-K and then someone said, what about childcare? And so we looked at that um, as well. And ultimately, of course, this decision falls on me. I'm gonna follow the advice of the doctors, but I am informed by those people who spend their lives taking you know, care of our kids in a school or a childcare setting. And so that is, uh, after uh, talking to them, that was the decision made. Thanks for the question. Uh, let me see what other hands are up or, and I see a lot of things in this chat box deal. Um, Okay, if I'm not doing it right, I don't see any many more hands up. So let me go now through the chat box. Um, hi, uh, Amy from Eater here. The order requires mask on property. How does that apply to outdoor dining spaces? So this is indoor uh, space, uh, not uh, outdoor space. Uh, Kevin Reese, restaurants and bars, what's your specific mask guidance for them? So that the specific mask guidance for restaurants and bars is contained in um, the um, order itself. Um, 
Now that does not apply to when you are eating and drinking. Obviously, um, if you're wearing your mask inside the building to go to the restroom, to go to your table and, and your you know, food gets there, you're drinking a drink, you're eating an appetizer, you can't do that with a mask on. Um, how does this policy affect high school football practice and games? Well, um, thus far, this particular policy does not affect um, outdoor activities because this policy is limited to indoor activities. Um, and I can't read. Can one of the young people please read um, Charles Scudder? Scott? I can repeat it if that's easier, Judge. Oh, okay. Yeah, please, because I, I can't. The, the prince was sure. too small for me to see it. Sure, no problem. Um, so in section two of the order, it mentions a potential fine for businesses. Um, but I'm wondering if there's any penalties for the child care centers or schools if they choose not to follow the order. So the the penalties at this point are, and, and this order is subject to change, but the penalties at this uh, point are uh, limited to the section set out. So there are not penalties for individuals. There are not penalties uh, uh, for schools, uh, but there are uh, penalties for uh, commercial businesses. Um, I believe that um, our schools um, will act in accordance with the law. Um, if, if we find that that is not true, I may have to revisit this. But, um, you know, that's based on the feedback that I have from everyone. That's what, what I decided to do. Um, and, and, and let me say this to, to Charles um, and everyone. If you remember, and of course there are outliers at everything, but if you remember, um, we've really worked closely together early on in this uh, pandemic. I had um, regular meetings with, you name it, just about every business. Uh, Fred Propol, who is the CEO of uh, our, our uh, city's largest construction company, Beck, uh, was my emissary, and we would pull together businesses. We would listen to them. We would listen to their workers. Uh, doctors would be on the call, and then we would come up with reasonable ways to keep working and keep safe and keep our economy open while protecting those employees. Um, and so uh, it's a close relationship and we're able to work together. I don't think anyone it, uh, writ large, any one group of people is likely to um, uh, you know, be fined because I think for most people, uh, it's probably a welcome thing that uh, for the people who don't like the mask, you can blame Judge Jenkins. For the people that do like the mask, you can say, well, I'm doing this to protect you because I care about you as a customer or employee. So, um, you know, when we look at child care centers, for instance, child care centers care about our kids. They're going to do their best to follow this. It may be you've got a kid throwing the mask off, having a screaming tantrum, um, and they're doing their best. But uh, in any snapshot in time, not every child uh, has their mask on because of this uh, tantrum or because of a you know asthma attack or something. Uh, but I think you can have faith in our child care centers, our pre-Ks and our schools to do what's um, best for kids. Um, and it helps them uh, to have this uh, because unfortunately others, not the schools, not the parents, but um, Others, in, in our case, you know, Governor Abbott and, uh, you know, some people in his political party uh, and following President Trump have politicized this masking, public health and vaccination um, when there really is no politics here. The virus doesn't care what, you, what your politics are, what your political party is, uh, how you feel about any issue. You know, the virus is just a... It's a virus and the way all viruses work is they look for people to infect if they run into a resistance because of immunity from the past virus or because of a new vaccine they look for ways to survive by finding ways around that 
So team, this is team public health and there shouldn't be any of that, uh, you know, politics or disagreement, but there is. And so this helps those folks who just want to help kids get back to helping and, and uh, nurturing kids. Any other, uh, I think that's it for the chat box. And, and uh, if I can figure out how to use my computer, or look through it one more time, we may have covered all the questions. And Judge, I had a question. It's Meredith Yeomans with NBC5. I just sure. wondered if you have considered what thresholds must be met to rescind this executive order. Yeah, Meredith, so that's a great question. Um, I was asked that by some business leaders today and I asked that of the doctors uh, yesterday. And it's a fast evolving situation. So um, we don't have some uh, number on a chart that I can point to and say, here's when you don't need to wear you know, a mask indoors. Um, what we know is that the CDC is telling us that in areas of high spread and they have a map and all of North Texas is in it, um, you need to wear a mask indoors. Uh, we, we are finding out new and unfortunately not good things about the Delta variant. And we have another variant coming on the, the heels of that one. This won't be our last variant. So uh, as our enemy uh, advances, we too will have to make you know allowances and changes. It's the hope that more and more people will get vaccinated and that uh, for a time people will wear the mask, the numbers will turn as they did before. And um, with that, with more vaccination particularly, comes um, you know, a better outlook for everyone and more freedom. Any other? Um... Yes, I have a question, Judge. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, uh, in the previous orders, uh, there were some capacity limits and why there were not the capacity limits considered at this point, given the aggressiveness of the Delta variant? So, um, Everything is being considered. Uh, uh, doctors and I are looking at this uh, daily, um, but this is where we are right now. Um, and um, that you may see more orders, you may see changes in that, but uh, we're, we're looking at this daily, we're trying to respond to it. Largely, we are where we are because the CDC that has the most scientists looking at this is where they are on what they're recommending. Any, and I, if you're like me, you may not know how to use the raise the hand function. So if anybody has them and I give anybody a chance to ask any questions, again, there are also lawyers here. Um, if you want to ask the lawyers a question or if you want to ask Melissa a question before we sign off, anyone else? Judge, there's a question from Bethany Erickson. If one of the lawyers can explain what happens if Abbott is successful in getting the TRO overturned and then that appeal is appealed, et cetera, could this be a mask on, mask off situation? Dale or one of the lawyers want to take that? I can, I'll take a whack at it, um, Judge Jenkins. Sorry, Doug. I should, um, should have done that. Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, what happens now is the case is set for a temporary injunction hearing on August 24. Um, and depending on what happens there, whoever is unsuccessful would have the right to appeal to the Dallas Court of Appeals, then ultimately that would go to the Texas Supreme Court. So um, I think in that situation, yes, it could be a mask on, mask off situation, depending on the outcomes, unfortunately. But um, unless anybody else on my team, appellate team thinks differently, I think that's the correct answer. I'll say something, uh, not about that. I think that's a great legal explanation. I have nothing to add, but I will say this. I was on a call with school superintendents this morning and someone made the point of, well, we're going to get into a deal where uh, the kids are told to wear the mask one day and then told they don't have to wear the mask, you know, three days or three weeks later. Um, and before I could answer, another superintendent said, so what? These are kids. They're going to do what we ask them to do. If they're told that they're required to wear a mask 
for uh, the rest of August and September. And then in October, they're told they can wear it if they want to. They'll adopt it to that. And then Michael Hinojosa pointed out that uh, they've had a mask mandate in place now for however many days, two or three days. And uh, everyone's done it. They hadn't had one single incident where uh, they've had a confrontation at a campus um, over a mask. And, and I think that's how the schools play out. And then I, I think also um, it's probably how businesses play out. Um, people may not like it, but um, you know, they'll do it. I, I don't like it. I don't like have, you know, in, in the heat of Texas, having to wear a mask on my face. Um, but on the other hand, I, I, I much more don't like the possibility of getting COVID or spreading it to others, even though I'm vaccinated and would have a very mild case. Um, one of my friends who's on this call uh, had a breakthrough case and it still knocks you down for two or three days. And then there's the danger of, of spreading it to other people. And so the, when you think about the mask, it's a small price to pay uh, to protect uh, our children and public health. And, and I, I've said, uh, again, I, I respect everyone, including people who believe that uh, masks are, um, are a abridgment of their personal rights. But I just you know, want to remind uh, the public that in times of war, and that's what we're in, we are in a war, all of us, not with each other, but with a virus that has claimed over 600,000 Americans and you know, more, I mean, a lot more people worldwide. And it's coming back with a vengeance and it's up to us to get together and win this battle so we can win this war. And in a time of a war, where would we be, for instance, when London was being bombed, if Winston Churchill had said, when the planes come over, we need you to turn your lights off and go to the shelter if you feel like it. But for those of you that have important work, leave your lights on. Um, uh, expose all the rest of us to harm because I care about your personal freedom. Of course, that would not happen. Your personal freedom is very important to me and to everyone, but your personal freedom does not extend to uh, hurting your neighbors, particularly in a time of a public health um, disaster like this, Think of it like a war, and we all need to do our part. And surely as Americans, we can hearken back to the great sacrifices of our ancestors and sacrifice enough to wear a mask when we go to the grocery store. Coach have... Jenkins, the only thing that I would add to uh, what, what Mr. Alexander said about the appellate process and the mask on off question is that the appellate process, as he described, will take a certain amount of time to go through uh, the courts and for them to give it their thoughtful consideration. And to the extent that uh, people have their own lives saved or the lives of loved ones saved by having the mask on during the on period, um, I think that is the, the real point of what you're doing here. Um, and to the extent that the masks come off after a period of time where lives have been saved, I think we would all say it's been worth it. Right. And, and to be clear, so it, it, it was the 24th of August was the next hearing. So we're looking at least at, a, a, you know, potentially 13 days here where the masks are definitely going to be on before it could get in front of a court and potentially be overruled. Assuming that there's not uh, some extraordinary, uh, the relief granted between those times, and that would be true. Bouncing off of Alex, um, I think I'm asking the same question too. So you guys are not anticipating any legal interference until that next court date. Is that what you're anticipating? Well, I would, <laughs> I would put it in th th this way: we're we're always hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Um, if things proceed as they normally should. Uh, nothing should happen between now and August 24. Um, but in the, uh, you know, in, in the world of law and appeals, we never say never. Um, any last uh, 
let me take if anybody has them a couple more questions um probably not surprising to any of you who know me but i've got call after call after call after this um uh you know with groups to to get their support um and answer their questions about this so let's take two more on uh, the first person that gets my attention <laughs> so anybody got it any? judge jenkins this is yep. charles I, I would like to say this um i i got the delta variant after being fully vaccinated and i have no doubt that but for the vaccination i would have been in the hospital i was really really sick and when you called me and asked me if if i would agree to represent you in this mission i didn't hesitate because i totally believe we are saving lives so i want you to know that i so respect the stand that you have taken um it's not sometimes politically expedient but it was the right thing to do for the people and i am honored to represent you well thank you so much charla i appreciate that uh, very much um you know and thank you and and all the lawyers here for the great work um that you've done i know that um but for the great work that you've done uh people would have gotten sick um some of them would have died uh, we would have run out of hospital space that may still unfortunately happen we are in a very grave situation i don't want the public to think oh this has happened and now if i wear a mask everything will be okay because that's just not true we've got a you know a, we can't all do everything but we can all do something and at a time like this we've got to do all that we can so if you got a loved one who's unvaccinated, um, I, I need you to talk to them. And, and people don't respond to, con to being condescending. They don't respond to people talking over them. They don't respond to being attacked, but they do respond to people that they love, that they respect, that they're maybe related to or work with, talking to them and saying things like, I care about you and I wanna understand uh, your concerns and why you aren't getting the vaccine and uh, and then you know answering those questions that people may have they may say well i want to wait um, until others get it and you can point out how many have already gotten it. or i heard that it causes whatever they heard and you can look it up and get them the information from even webmd or a local site a local doctor uh, that the actual what is the actual information uh, because uh, if every vaccinated person got an unvaccinated person to get vaccinated this would be over right um so uh everybody that's, that's why i post i posted on social media about me contracting the delta variant because i thought if it affected just one person if just one person would get vaccinated because of that then it's worth it yeah and i appreciate you charla for for, uh, I'm not going to release people's health information, but I appreciate you, uh, you know, sharing that. Any last question before we hop off? Uh, Judge, uh, here Imelda Garcia from Aldi. I have a, I have a question for you. Uh, sure. Does this commercial entity concept includes any private company? I mean, businesses or offices, or yeah. is it just for business that receive clients and visitors? And, and that's it. So. It includes, um, let me read it out exactly so that I'm not uh, paraphrasing it, but give me just one second, Melba. Um, so it is all commercial entities in Dallas County providing goods or services directly to the public so it, it, you know to use a hypothetical would, would that include a uh, a lawyer's office well yes a lawyer's office provides goods and services to the public um well with that you know obviously it includes uh, a store 
but it includes much more than just stores. It's all commercial entities that provide goods and services to the public. And that is all there in uh, the order uh, for people. And by the way, if you have questions about this, if you're, if you're watching this on Facebook Live and you've got a company, you have questions about this, um, you know, I don't know that we have the staff to get everybody's question answered, but you can email me at dcjudge uh, at dallascounty.org. Uh, That's D for Dallas and C for county judge at dallascounty.org. And we'll try to get that answered. We've got me and others uh, trying to look at those. And, um, you know, if, you're, if, if, you, uh, if you, for instance, are a retailer, um, I know the retailers are putting out some guidance on this or restaurant tour. The restaurant association already has guidance on this called a, something about a promise, the restaurant tours promise that is the guidance on this. Uh, similarly, other trade associations uh, have guidance on this. So you can also go to your, uh, your, your trade association uh, for guidance on this uh, as well. Thank you all so much uh, for being here today. Thank you um to the public uh that joined us on facebook live um uh i'm hopeful that um uh, we will uh, turn the tide somewhat uh with these orders and um you know that's the goal it's it's not um anybody any person versus any other person it's all of us team public health versus the virus thank you all so much take care